Hi, everyone. My name is Ariana. Uh, welcome to our ISDF second virtual budget training. Um, before we get started, um, if you require any support, um, please um, share that in the chat. We are here to support you. We do have closed captioning. Um, and just a reminder for folks, if we can just slow down the pace of when we're speaking to be courteous to the folks supporting us tonight. Um, so again, thank you for joining us um, this evening. My pronouns are she or her, Aya, and I'll be um, court moderating tonight's event along with Angelina and Blair from CPI. If y'all wanna say hi. So um, Blair actually already shared this, but if you are arriving, uh, if you could share your name, your pronoun, and the reason why you're here tonight, um, we would like to get to know a few folks and thank you for joining us. Um, so even though we are meeting virtually, I would like to um, take some time um, to acknowledge that we are meeting on the land of Kumeyaay people. We honor the original ancestors of this land and strive to be accountable by acknowledging this history and cultivating respect for indigenous people and their land. We appreciate everyone for being here. If you have any questions throughout the presentation throughout the workshop, um, please use the chat box um, and feel free to chat with us. And, and thank you all for coming again and we can transition to Blair. Thanks, Ariana. Hello, everybody. So glad you're here. Um, I love seeing the introductions in the chat. Uh, don't forget to put your names, pronouns, where you live, and why you're here, really connect with uh, the, at least at this point, you know, we've got 50 people already here in the room with us, what we share with one another um, in the different communities. So we've got Shanti and Charlie and Aaron and Patty. So glad y'all are here. So let me... There we go. So uh, first, oh, did we lose our agenda? Oh, I'll do this first then. So who is ISDF? The Invest in San Diego Families Coalition um, is a coalition of community labor and faith organizations that work together to advocate for a county where all San Diegans can thrive and have quality lives. And you can see here uh, our list of current partners. And I'll switch to Spanish in just a moment while you're looking there. And our partners represent different facets of our issues and all strive to uplift and advocate for the residents of our community, whether it's civil rights, environmental justice, reproductive health, or providing legal services, services, I should say, and resources for tenants. Oops, got a trigger happy uh, thing here. Um, our coalition brings together different voices to organize for social justice causes. So you can, if, you, if you're from one of those orgs, we've already seen some shout outs in the chat, go ahead and shout out your organization. And the lived experiences we share make this work incredibly powerful and moving at times. And especially when I have a chance to hear my coalition members share their stories during public comment, it's really inspiring and you know, feels empowering and that we're not alone. We have a whole group of people that are working together with us. And so I wanna start actually with a story and I'm going to turn it over to Aaron, who's a member of SEIU, to share their story about why they decided to be involved with county budgets. So Aaron, I'll turn it over to you. Hi, right, thanks, Blair. Can you hear me or see me or whatever it is? Yeah, we can hear you. So glad. Yeah. All right. Uh, good afternoon. My name is Aaron Garrett. My pronouns are he, him, and his. I've worked for the county for 11 years as a protective services worker in extended foster care, and I'm a proud Union member of SEIU 221, as well as a job steward for my office. 
One reason why I got involved in the budget process is because of what I've seen as far as the county using seemingly the bare minimum of social workers in order to investigate and manage unreasonable amount of cases while having little to no empathy for management about the caseloads and about other issues within the agency. I currently have 25 youth on my caseload in EFC, extended foster care, and only three of these youth are Caucasian, which is a disproportionate amount of youth of color related to the population of San Diego, as families of color have seemingly been a target of the county and a target of our society as well. Within the last several months, some of my youth, um, some of the youth on my caseload have endured the following. A death of a youth on my caseload due to a drug overdose, near death to a youth on my caseload due to them being assaulted with a deadly weapon. A youth on my caseload assaulting two other youth with a deadly weapon, seriously injuring them and having to interact with these youth on a monthly basis. A youth on my caseload allegedly sexually assaulting another youth and posting it on social media. A youth attempting to overdose on medication several times, cutting on themselves and expressing that they no longer want to live. Taking a youth to a psychiatric facility due to them being catatonic, not eating and overall unable to care for themselves. I've had to interact with all of these youth in person despite potential hazards and then potentially having COVID-19 as a few of these youth on my caseload have contracted it. I brought these issues up to my supervisor, consulted with our staff psychologist about the psychological impact of having such unreasonable workload and brought the psychologist into unit meetings so that my unit members can voice their concerns, um, because, but it was still not enough. I've had mediations with a mediator present with management due to defensiveness about the issues and the issues of them being perfectionists not open to hear the concerns of workers and creating their own narratives about why my people continue to transfer out of the job in EMC that used to be coveted to some extent. I worked my- Hey, Aaron, yeah. I'm just gonna pause you right there. And if you can slow down just a little, just to make oh. sure, I wanna make sure our folks in Spanish can hear your full story and your okay. captioners too. Thanks. Okay, sorry. Uh, where was I at? Uh, I worked my way up to the director in order to plead with them about the conditions we were working in and the impact to us and our youth, who again are mostly of color. The director seemingly listened, but it was still not enough. So I had to get further involved with the union. I have spoken to the board of supervisors on a couple of occasions and outlined what I am telling you now in order to get the attention of management. I'm working hard through the lens of diversity and inclusion to expose the wrongs that have been done by our agency to youth and families of color in order to expose the truth so that the county will ultimately be forced to once and for all provide adequate care to youth they claim to care about by allotting us the human resources we need to actually do good in communities of color uh, as they have been oppressed for too long. However, it is extremely difficult to do this work without being adequately supported with the resources we need to succeed. This is why we deserve hazard pay due to the conditions we have been working in a higher wage and more workers to meet our workload needs. I encourage all members of the county to speak up and back each other up in order to ensure that we are no longer abused and exploited by those in power and in order for us to better serve our communities. As an SEIU union member, I want to thank ISDF and the community members on the call for allowing me to speak my truth today. Ultimately, we all want our communities to thrive, but the only way we will make change is by speaking truth to power. Thank you so much, Erin, for sharing your story. Um, and we're going to spend um, a lot of the rest of our time um, helping you to have the, all of you here to have the information you need to be able to bring your stories to the county and the decision makers who decide where our money goes. And so to that end, I'm gonna show you our agenda briefly. We'll talk about the county budget process and advocacy opportunities. We'll talk about ISDF priorities, your story of self, and we'll actually break into breakout rooms for you to start writing that story and getting ready to speak on some of the issues you're gonna hear about. And we're gonna take action together. So with that, I'm gonna turn it over to Angelina, uh, who works for CPI and one is, is one of our researchers and policy advocates here. And so uh, I'll turn it over to Angelina to give us all the info. Thanks, Blair. Um, hi, everyone. My name is Angelina Corsani. I am a researcher and policy advocate with the Center on Policy Initiatives and the Invest in San Diego Families Coalition. I will be doing a quick overview of the county budget and budget process, 
going over what has happened, where we are at now in the budget process, and what important opportunities for advocacy are left for the rest of this fiscal year. Some general notes on the county budget for those of you who might not know, some of you might already know this, um, but first, just to quickly go over what the county budget covers. San Diego County is the second largest county in the state and the fifth largest in the country based on population. So we have a massive budget of over $7 billion. This budget is created based on the directions of the County Board of Supervisors, which is made up of five individuals elected by residents of each of the five county districts. And the budget is also created by the Chief Administrative Officer or the CAO. You can think of the CAO as the CEO of the county She's the person in charge, the person who handles finances and pulls together information from the rest of the county departments. Counties are subdivisions of state governments. So counties are responsible for providing state and federal programs at the regional level. This covers a lot of different areas. I won't be able to name them all, but some key ones include health services, mental health services, housing, including Section 8 vouchers, running elections, enrolling people in CalFresh, Medi-Cal, CalWorks, providing foster care services and child support services. The county sheriff is also in charge of all of our local jails. And as we all know now, the county is also responsible for public health and responding to local emergencies, which includes pandemic response. The way the county provides all of those services and more than the ones I listed is through four different operating groups or agencies. The Health and Human Services Agency, which I may refer to as HHSA, Public Safety Group, sorry, Public Safety Group or PSG, Land Use and Environment Group or LUGE, and Finance and General Government Group. Within these four large groups, there are multiple departments that each provide a certain type of services. So, for example, under HHSA, there is the Public Health Services Department, Behavioral Health Services Department, Housing and Community Development Department, and many more. That's the largest group in the county budget, so there's a whole bunch more departments. But again, um, within those four large groups, there are multiple departments that each provide a certain type of services. And I think there are more than 40 county departments in total. The reason I mention this is because the county budget is also split among those four operating groups. That is how our county allocates money to provide all of those services to a massive population of 3.3 million people with a budget of over $7 billion and a workforce of over 18,000 county employees. The main point I wanna make here is that there are a lot of county resources available and a lot of county responsibilities. And that means there are also a lot of opportunities for advocacy and for the public to engage and give input on how the county can use these resources and better execute its responsibilities to serve the public. Every single cent of that $7 billion is public money. So this is your money and you are entitled to give your input on how it should be spent. And the second note is that the county budget does not cover the regular calendar year, it covers a fiscal year. So instead of January to December, the county's fiscal year goes from July 1st to June 30th. And the budget is developed in a cycle on an ongoing ba basis throughout each fiscal year. So the county starts developing its budget for the next year in the fall. The process continues throughout the year and the final budget is adopted at the end of June. So hopefully that helps give a sense of where we're at because I want you all to be able to understand where we are in the budget process and how exactly you can have an impact right now. It is June, so we are in the last few weeks of finalizing the budget for fiscal year 2022, which will, and fiscal year 2022 will start on July 1st in a few weeks and end in June of next year. So our coalition has been working throughout this budget cycle from fall of last year to January of this year. Um, our coalition developed our budget and policy priorities. And in December and January, we were able to meet with county supervisors, the CAO or chief administrative officer, and the heads of some key county groups and departments to share our priorities and try to influence them before the budget was finalized. 
this next year, we would like to do that even earlier, hopefully sometime in the fall. Um, because of advocacy that our coalition has done this upcoming fiscal year, the county will be using a new process for the first time to develop the budget. We hope that this means there will be opportunities for the public to give more input earlier on in the budget process. So you all can influence what comes out in the first draft of the budget, rather than having to wait for the budget to be created and asking for things to be added in after the fact. So that is something to look forward to for next year. But coming back to this year, um, in early May, the first draft of the budget or the proposed budget is released. So this year, the county's fiscal year 2022 proposed budget came out on May 6th. We reviewed it and were able to see which of our priorities made it into the budget and which ones were not included. And then in late May or last week, the county held departmental hearings for the very first time. This happened for the first time ever because of recommendations that came directly from our ISDF coalition. These departmental hearings took place from 9 a.m. to 4 p.m. on May 26th and 27th. In these hearings, each department was required to present its budget and answer questions from the supervisors. We were also able to work with the supervisors and get answers to some of the questions that our coalition partners had. And in the future, this will become a permanent part of the budget process so that there are more opportunities for members of the public to learn about and give input on specific budgets of county departments. And right now we are in early June. So on June 14th, there will be another budget presentation during the daytime. People can call in and give input then. June 16th is a really important date. This is the evening budget hearing. Again, this exists because of the ISDF coalition. Our coalition pushed for this to be added to the budget process a few years back. And this is the only opportunity for public input on the budget that takes place outside of regular working hours. So it's a really important opportunity for folks to call in, share your stories and push the supervisors to make sure your priorities are represented in the budget. June 29th is when the final budget deliberations will take place. The supervisors will make final changes to the budget and vote to adopt it, adopt it to make it final and official. So right now, as you can tell, is a really key window of opportunity. The supervisors and the CAO are developing what are called change letters. A change letter is a list that each supervisor and the CAO makes that lays out what their top priorities are for what should be included in the final draft of the budget. So right now, our goal is for our remaining priorities to be included in the CAO and supervisors change letters so we can make sure those priorities are funded in the final draft of the county budget. In addition, this year is a little bit different because of COVID. So there is one more very important date, which is June 8th, uh, which is next Tuesday. So because of COVID-19, the county has received a lot of money from the state and federal governments. The state and federal governments are sending money to local governments because local governments are the ones handling COVID response and vaccinations. This takes a lot of people, a lot of county workers and a lot of money. So the county really needs this stimulus money to pay for COVID response, as well as additional community needs that have come about because of COVID like rental assistance, for example. That means that in addition to the $7 billion county budget, there is another pot of money that is being allocated this year. The county has received $996.1 million, so close to $1 billion in stimulus funding. That includes $653.5 million from the American Rescue Plan Act, which is also called ARPA, this is the stimulus package recently put forward by President Joe Biden that I'm sure a lot of you heard about. The county has to allocate these ARPA funds by the end of 2024 and can actually spend this money up until the end of 2026. So this will be an important pot of money for the next few years. And another 342.6 million comes from other stimulus packages that have been passed this year for again, a total of $996.1 million or almost $1 billion 
in ARPA and other stimulus funding. The reason this is important for you all to know about is because on June 8th, the Board of Supervisors will be voting on how that almost a billion dollars in stimulus funds will be spent. There are already some plans in place. A good chunk of the money, um, close to $400 million, will go directly to COVID response. So that means for COVID testing, tracing, treatments, and vaccinations. For the rest of the money, on April 6th, about two months ago, um, the board approved a general framework with some initial ideas on how the money should be spent. County staff has had to do some additional work since then to get details and actually uh, wait to actually receive the first um, ARPA payment, which comes with the guidelines from the federal government for what restrictions may or may not come with that money or on what it can and can't be spent on. The county finally received their first ARPA payment in mid-May, just a few weeks ago. So next Tuesday, June 8th, county staff will be presenting a final plan that the supervisors will discuss, change if they want to, and vote on. Uh, Sophia, who will be presenting right after me, will get into which of our priorities have been included in the county budget and the plan for spending ARPA and stimulus funds and which ones we still need your support on to make sure they get funded. But before I turn it over to her, I will do a very quick recap. So again, right now is a very key time for advocacy and for you all to share your input. On June 8th, the Board of Supervisors will be voting on how to spend $996.1 million in ARPA and other stimulus funds. On June 16th is the evening budget hearing, which is dedicated to getting input from the public on the budget. And it's super important leading up to June 29th when final changes to the budget will be made and it will be adopted. What I always like to end on is please remember the county budget, including the stimulus funds is made up of public dollars. All of this money, every single cent is your money and you have every right to push your elected officials, um, your elected leaders to make sure your needs are represented. Uh, thank you all for your time. I will now pass it to Sophia from Youth Will and ISDF. Thank you, Angelina. Um, good evening, everyone. Thank you all for being here. My name is Sophia Haidari, she, her pronouns, and I'm an organizer with Youth Will and a member of the Invest in San Diego Families Coalition. Our coalition is comprised of different groups that work directly with impacted, uh, with impacted communities and center the needs of San Diego families. And based off of the feedback from our community members, we've categorized our demands and our priorities into the following. Transparency, accessibility, and account accountability, um, which includes things like a rental registry, language access and COVID-19 data transparency to ensure that our communities are informed about what's happening in our region so that our needs don't go unmet. Smart justice and redefining public safety, which includes investment in safer and more effective alternatives to policing, as well as shifting our approach to youth and young adults within the criminal justice system and ending practices that criminalize poor people such as cash bail and profit off of those in the system, such as the high cost of phone calls for incarcerated individuals. Um, our next priority is the people's economy and good jobs, um, which is to ensure that our communities have access to jobs with protections and livable wages and are not being exploited and that there is equity in our local economy. Um, next is healthy neighborhoods and safety ladder, which is to ensure that those who are in need have access to and receive the resources that they need. Rather than a safety net, which is meant to catch you when you fall, we call it a safety ladder because in addition to catching you, we also need there to be pathways for success for our most vulnerable communities. Um, and the last one is immigrant communities and access to services, which includes providing support for asylum seekers and creating an Office of Immigrant Affairs. Um, so having run through all of those priorities and kind of um, detailing them a bit, which of these priorities are you ready to be a champion for? Um, and you can put your answer in the chat.
Yeah, let's see them in the chat. And while you're doing that, our, our wonderful captioners are gonna switch off so they can take a break. So take some time right now, which of these are like, I, even if you love all of them, what's the one that you're ready to like on Tuesday or on the 16th, like this is the thing that I wanna see change in my county budget. Yeah. Smart justice, yep. Mm -hmm. Um, we got a lot of champions in this room. So when we, when we, do you want me to show the English again? Yeah, sure. Make sure everybody, there's the English. So we're so excited that you're willing to and wanting to be involved in this budget process. And as we already showed you, there's two very soon opportunities for you to do that. So June 8th, this coming Tuesday, as well as June 16th. And our next section of our uh, time together is going to be getting you prepared to advocate for those times, but also to prepare you to learn to tell your story and, um, and understand how it can make a difference. So I'm going to uh, turn it over here to Ariana and uh, she'll lead us through the next part. Thank you, Blair. Oops, wrong one, went too far. There you go. Hi, everyone. Um, thank you, Sophia. Um, before we actually go into the workshop, we just wanna create some space to acknowledge um, the impact of um, really embodying the story of self and the importance of um, continuing to build off the stories of so many people that have continued to advocate um, for all things at the federal, local level, um, cross, uh, cross borders, um, not only in public comment, in, in lobby visits, even when we're base building with each other and bringing in new folks. Um, and really acknowledging folks' power. Um, as organizers and as community members, we learn the story of self. So like how does telling our own stories really impact change? And change is really beautiful when it happens um, collectively. Um, so I just wanna invite again, Sophia um, for a few um, minutes. So that she's so that she can share her story of self and how that has um, actually um, impacted the county. Um, recently, we've had really great wins, um, and just want to give some space for folks to share of like what the story of self has really meant for them and for their own advocacy. And. Ariana, I'm just, I'm going to pause here because in trying to make sure that we have plenty of time for people to be in their workshops and stuff, Sophia and I kind of chatted and we're just going to show the video in a minute of one of our community members advocating for something they need, if that's all right. Um, yeah. And so, yeah, we'll, uh, we'll instead move on to asking folks in the, in the chat or, you know, the next parts and we'll get to a video in just a second. My apologies. So we'll turn it to, over to y'all um, in the chat. How does telling our stories impact change? Maybe you can think of a time where someone told you a story and it changed your perspective or decision that you wanted to make. Are you asking for someone to share their story? Oh, thank you for asking a clarifying question, Nicole. Um, yeah, I think the question is, how do, how do we, you know, as humans, um, how, does it how does telling our stories yeah, sorry. Sorry. make change? So if you have an answer to that question, I'd love to hear it. I do. Um, I'm a firm believer in sharing your testimony, telling someone else 
um, what you're going through and how when people don't know something's broke, they can't fix it. So when you share your story, especially when you're dealing with policy uh, writers and people of those influence and telling them what you're going through because people have a misconceived notion that because there are laws and there's because there's things exposed to be in place that everything is honky dory when actually it's a, a chaotic mess. Mm. Thank you, Nicole. And I see some other great, you know, things here about relatable pictures for listeners, um, establishes personal relationship, creates empathy, concrete, makes things concrete. Um, so yeah, absolutely. And it also um, puts Ariana, the, face the issue. Is that one more time? It also puts a face to the issue. Amen. Yeah, very true. Ariana, we want to talk through this next part. Yeah. Um, so the impact, thank you, Nicole, for sharing. I think that really does acknowledge the impact of really telling your story and your, and exper your experience. Um, so we have like the three different types. So there is the story of self, like who are you? Where are you coming from? what is the current situation or the solution that matters to you, um, the issue that you're experiencing or you're, you're seeing um, arrive in your community. And then there's the story of us. So like, how is it that this can impact your community? Who are the people in your life um, or at large in your community that um, this issue hurts and that this solution would actually help? Um, I think that this really invites a lot of folks to have um, to start having honest conversations about what are the issues and how we can come into a collective consensus of how we're offering solutions um, with for each other that uplift all of us. And then the story of us. So what is the um, the current um, urgency um, for everyone? And it's important to also acknowledge like what is the importance of the moment and what can we all do to really find a solution together. Um, so the story of us, the story of self um, and the story of now is really to uplift like the work that we all do and that we all care about. Um, and I think ISDF as a coalition, we do this a lot. We come from different backgrounds, um, different places of our work, but we're really here to acknowledge um, that work that needs to be done for our communities, investing in San Diego families. Um, so uh, we will be transitioning into breakout rooms. Um, actually, we'll go into the video for a moment. Blair, do you want to share your audio? Thank you. I forgot I had to be unmuted. Here we go. Oh, we still can't hear it, Blair. When you share your video, it gives you the option to also share your audio. It might be that. It's like I'm a rookie or something. Like I've never done this before. Hold on. It's not true. Let's try again. Yeah. I, when, once you share the screen, then it'll give you the option to share audio as well. Yep. I got it. Thank y'all. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank 
muchas veces ahorita no hemos venido a, a quejarnos porque muchas personas sienten miedo, esa impotencia de no poder tener con quién poder venir a apoyarnos. Soy una persona que, que no nada más mira mi situación mía, sino miro la situación de mi comunidad. Estoy... Uh, espantada por todo lo que nos ven los dueños, nos ven como máquinas, ya no nos ven como seres humanos, nos ven el signo de pesos porque cada vez nos suben más y más, no hay un control. Siento que ustedes pueden hacer mucho, pueden hacer más porque van a tener familias más llenas de salud, más llenas de vida, más llenas de, de poder hacer cosas nuevas. Todos podríamos ya no trabajar tanto, sino dedicarnos más a nuestros hijos, tener una, una vida diferente. Podríamos hacer muchas cosas con ustedes, pero ustedes deben de parar esto, porque esto que está sucediendo no nada más en mi comunidad de Lindavista, sino todo San Diego. Basta ya de tanto vernos como en realidad ya no seres humanos. Les pido de favor que se pongan la mano en el corazón, que nos apoyen, que nos ayuden con personas capacitadas como una barra de de abogados, porque cuando vamos a pedir apoyo no hay nadie, o, o un cónsul o una persona que se enfoque realmente en apoyar a toda esta situación. Gracias y les pido que realmente que ustedes vean que también están viviendo en un techo, que ustedes tienen una casa digna, tal vez nosotros no la tenemos, pero sí necesitamos de su apoyo. Gracias. I'm reading um, Jessica's comment that she um that Ana Maria is amazing and a fierce advocate and I think that you could really hear it um in the tone and the presence um it was personal and not technical and I think that really brings in the purpose of um our story of self um we're not always in the same situation but I think that we can definitely build and build solidarity with each other um and we'll actually get into that in our breakout groups so we